Welcome back to St. Andrews. We're about to finish 1 Peter. It's going to be a big section. We're going to look at chapter 4, verses 12, all the way through chapter 5, verse 14, which concludes 1 Peter. What I'd like you to do as we're going through this section is at times think about what the takeaways were for you from 1 Peter. I have found it a very profound book, and I hope it impacts you as much as it has me. Let's get going. I'll see you over in the parish hall. Well, good morning. Here we go. This is, this is our last session uh, on 1 Peter. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to take a, a broader review of chapter 4, verses 12 through 5, 4. Uh, because those on uh, watching on computer missed last week. So I'm going to try to do a sweep a little more detail than normal on our review and then we'll jump into chapter 5 verses 5 through 14 and finish up this uh, this fabulous book the Lord be with you let us pray oh blessed Lord we just ask you to come and be present with us be uh, fill us fill us with your Holy Spirit that we will understand more fully this great book and that we may think about the takeaways that we have from this study in Jesus name amen, amen. okay so let's the, let's for the uh, sake of those watching on computer let's go ahead and and take a look at chapter 4 verses 12 f uh, down to chapter 5 verse 4 now, I'm, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I know some of you have other versions, which I think is great. I appreciate you bringing those. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. All right, first of all, the things that jump out at me are do not be surprised. Now, that's, that's been the theme throughout this book. Don't be surprised that you've got pushback. Don't be surprised that, that people uh, oppose you. Then it goes in to say, don't be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes upon you. Fiery. Uh, now, I was thinking about fiery and went back to chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. Now, remember the principles of... Uh, of writing, even in the in the ancient documentation, is that is that the first few paragraphs of a letter will generally give you the themes that are going to show up all through the uh, the the book, which is nothing. That's just good writing. So I will go to chapter one, verses six and seven. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So right in the very beginning of this book, Peter was telling us, hey, we're going to be talking about w testing and trials and the fiery... Um, uh, uh, um, uh, I want to say tempering of our souls and sure enough that's what he's referring to in chapter 4 verse 12 so it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you so the testing here is is what we experience in life uh, there is no guarantee that you're going to go through life untested and that just simply means that things are going to happen and the question is how are you going to come through that testing those who come through it uh, facing suffering and pushback let's say um, are the ones who will be more firm in their faith verse 13 but rejoice now rejoice here is an imperative in but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So rejoice. Don't, don't get down and long-faced because you've got uh, temptation or trials coming at you. Uh, know that Christ's suffering, 
set the way for all of us to experience and, to, and be victorious through any kind of suffering that we go through. So rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Glory, by the way, is a word that shows up 14 times in the book of 1 Peter. And it's packed in chapter 4 and chapter 5. There's some key uh, moments when glory shows up. Um, so just keep that in the back of your mind as we move through this. Verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. See, it just continues to go. Um, if you're insulted because of Christ, well, that's, it's okay. You just do some rejoicing. Um, do some rejoicing in that. And then it, go, it goes on to verse 15, which is fascinating. But let none of you suffer as murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. See how many times glory shows up already in these, these uh, three verses, four verses? So let none of you suffer as murderer or thief or evildoer and, then, and believe that you can rejoice over that. So it's saying, look, if you're, if you're persecuted um, or suffer in the name of Jesus for doing what Jesus calls you to do, then, then you can rejoice. But if you're going to go out and you're a murderer or an evildoer in any kind of way, don't think just because you're, somebody's opposing you that that's something to rejoice about. He's, he's basically saying, get it straight. There's one kind of, of, uh, of persecution that is okay, and that is being persecuted for Christ. Then I want you to drop down to verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So the name of Christ. You are Christians. That is who you are. You are little Christ. Now Christian shows up three times in the New Testament. That's all. Christian shows up three times. The first is Acts 11, 26, Acts 26, 28, and here in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. So Christian then is a pejorative term when it's used in, uh, in the New Testament. It's what others called these, these people that followed Christ. Oh, they're just little, they're little Christ's. It was a pejorative term. It was not a positive term. It turns around, of course, in, uh, in church history, in the early church, that we took on that title as little Christ because it was an honor to, to represent Christ. So we became Christian. But in the beginning, it was a pejorative term. Now, verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And it begins with us. What will, we be, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So this section, I just want you to recognize that the quotation that, uh, that Peter uh, uses comes from Proverbs chapter 11, verse 31. The righteous is scarcely saved. What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So let's just drop down to the conclusion that he draws in verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So trust, your, trust, trust God. Now this is creator, it says. This is, this is the creator God. This is, this is the God that put everything in motion by a mere um, f divine fiat or divine pro proclamation out of God's mouth. 
And this is the creator who has created you and has created me. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls. You can trust God is what he's saying. You can trust God even in the midst of, of uh, suffering. You remember the, the quote that I gave you from the pastor who was in um, uh, communist, uh, I, I want to say Romania, but I don't think that's It is Romania, okay. Let, let, let me just say that, uh, the, read this quote to you again, because it sort of captures that 17, 18, and 19. This is the uh, Joseph who was, uh, who had been captured by the communist in Romania in 1970. And this is Joseph speaking to the interrogator. I told the interrogator, you should know your supreme weapon is killing. My supreme weapon is dying. Now here is how it works, sir. You know that my sermons are on tape all over the country. When you shoot me or crush me, which way you choose, you only sprinkle my sermons with my blood. Everybody who has a tape of one of my sermons will pick it up and say, I had better listen again. This is what he died for. This is what he preached. Sir, my sermons will speak ten times louder after you kill me and because you kill me. In fact, I will conquer this country for God because you killed me. Go ahead. Do it. What a powerful statement <laughs> of one's faith, one's certainty in, in God, the Creator, uh, that he will be um, upheld, even if he dies. He's not, he's not negotiating here with God. He's simply telling the interrogator that if you kill me, you will have unleashed upon this country everything you're trying to stop. So let's move into uh, chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 1. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, as well as a partaker of the glory that is going to be revealed. So he starts out with referring to himself as an elder. He's an elder among elders. And as I r reminded you last week, he starts this, this uh, letter out reminding them that he is an apostle. He's not the apostle. Um, he's, there, there is humility. In fact, I would uh, maybe even capture chapter 5 as the chapter on humility. But he's very humble. I'm not the apostle. I'm an apostle. Now he says, I am an elder. An elder among elders. So he, he comes to them on the same level, this eye to eye, not one speaking above the other uh, elders. Now an elder is a shepherd. And uh, the uh, fellow elders wit, um, must be those who have witnessed suffering. The shepherd must have witnessed suffering. Um, and the suffering of Christ as well as a partaker of the glory that is going to be revealed. So there, there is a, a tempering that is expected among the shepherds uh, that they have witnessed the suffering. Just like as I reminded you of the calling of Matthias to be the twelfth apostle after um, uh, to, to take uh, Judas's place and remember the the criteria for being an apostle at that point was that you had seen witnessed the death of Jesus and that you uh, um, you, you have experienced uh, suffering of, uh, within uh, the, uh, the, the early church. So those were two really important criteria. And so Peter is simply saying, hey, look, um, those of you who are shepherds in Asia Minor, um, you need to have witnessed. You need to understand that there's suffering among your people. Then he goes on to say, shepherd, uh, uh, verse 2, shepherd the flock of God, that is among you, exercising oversight, not under uh, compulsion,
but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So he's very specific. This whole little section here is addressed specifically to elders. Now the elder is not to be uh, called or put in the position of elder under compulsion. Um, but this is, this is something that must be willingly received and, uh, uh, and lived out. And you're not supposed to do this for, for gain. You're not supposed to do this for, for financial gain. Um, this, is, uh, this is something that you do out of the goodness of your heart. And when, when the chief shepherd appears, now who the chief shepherd is, of course, is Jesus. When he comes at the second coming, he will, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So Jesus then will, will provide the, the crown of glory to his under shepherds. So we have the great shepherd Jesus who has under shepherds who, are, who lead the flock. And there'll be more of that in chapter five. Now remember, I did um, give you Ezekiel 34 verses 3 through 6 uh, as probably one of the finest statements about what a, a shepherd is supposed to, to do and be. And let me see if I can get that quickly. Ezekiel 34. Yeah, Ezekiel 34, 3 through 6. Let me just read that to you. This is a powerful statement. You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back to the lost, you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth, with none to search or seek for them. Wow. Now that's, that's a, a stiff um, rebuke of the, uh, the shepherds of Israel during uh, Ezekiel's time. This is, this is a powerful statement. And if, if I know I gave an assignment if, that if you wanted to, you could go back and read the rest of chapter 34, which is all focused on what it means to be a shepherd. Okay, that was a, a sweeping overview of, of last week. Any any questions or comments from you that you'd like to add? Were the elders, were, were they like pastors? Were they the it, the that's correct, yeah. Uh, the, an elder in First Peter is a shepherd, i.e. a pastor. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. They were receiving all the recognition and not doing anything to help the people. And so Peter steps in. I believe Peter's modeling everything he's saying here based on Ezekiel chapter 34. I think he's, he's saying, look, <laughs> we've seen this before. Don't fall into this trap as uh, is what happened in, uh, in Israel. Um, what you, this is what you need to do. And you're not in this for the money. You're not in this for the prestige. Um, you are in this because God has called you and you willingly step into this role and now take care of the flock. So it's a, it's a stiff condemnation that he's drawing from uh, Ezekiel chapter 34. Yeah. Anybody else? It seems that that is something that, that, that the, um, the elders and shepherds have to constantly 
have in front of them because it it constantly happens through the history. Right. The shepherds uh, kind of get take their eyes off the flock. That's right. And put it on themselves. That's right. You're right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Greta is, is uh, just simply saying that this is a this is something that uh, that shepherds need to be reminded of all through history. We have enough examples of people of leaders in history who have uh, taken their eyes off of Jesus and taken their put their eyes on themselves. Thus, the uh, the flock suffers because of that. Yeah. You're talking just about religious shepherds in this case. Yeah, Don. I think he is talking simply about religious shepherds and not and not to, not not political leaders in in a broad sense. I think this is I think this is very narrow, and just uh, about uh, 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 pastors. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Here we go. We got some new material to look at, and let's go to uh, chapter five, verse verse four. What we're dealing with here is, I think, a, a focus on. Uh, humbly submitting to God and to submitting one to another. This relationship is real important for us to grasp. There is a submission to God and, that, and yet there's a submission one to another also. And we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, verse 5, verse, um, let's see, where are we? Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. All right, you who are younger. So what do you think he's referring to here? Do you think he's referring to uh, those who are younger versus older, or is it possible that they're referring to those who are younger in their faith compared to those who are older in their faith? So that, that may be uh, something for us to just kind of consider. So let's put the, this idea of submission back into its context. Remember, we had a whole lot of of a discussion about what it means to submit from chapter 2 verse 13 through chapter 3 verse 7 submission in civics submission in marriage submission in business it all has this idea of following the established rules of relationships so submission is about relationships it's not about power that's not it at all. It's about how we submit one to another in relationship, even if it's a civic relationship, even if it's with the government, there's, there's direction given to us. So we've got then a younger, and I would say younger in faith, submitting to the older, and the younger in faith submitting to the one who, who has, who's been around a while. Who's, who knows their scripture, uh, who has, has experienced probably the suffering or the pushback, experienced also the glory of what it means to be a, a, a follower of Jesus. So submission in church context has its own unique look, and it is a discipleship or imitation model of submission. Are there, are there people in your lives who have been the the models for you? Is there, is there anyone that jumps out in your mind as, as that person who modeled for you Christianity, advising you in your walk, or instructing you in, in your walk with Christ? Anyone jump out at you? Mother, your mother, your mother, your mother, your mother, absolutely. <laughs> what, what would we do without moms, huh? And some friends, Greta says, yeah. Uh-huh. And here. Uh-huh. And um, I think who are still living. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yep. 
I'll tell you what, yeah, absolutely. And I, um, I've had some strong women in my life who have been real, real important in my walk. I mean, they sort of, they were willing to smack me upside the head and get me back on track. Um, um, and then there were some, there were some men later on in my life was I was getting uh, early to mid twenties that were instrumental in uh, in taking their putting their arm around me and walking with with me. So we understand this this relationship, which can be an age relationship, but I think we're talking about those who have a faith. Remember, I told you about Caleb and the uh, the two men that got up and walked out of uh, when he was preaching. Um, and uh, sometimes young people can have a deep faith that those of us who are older, sometimes we need to, to pay attention to what they have to say. They, they may not have all the life experience, but they've got a passion inside of them that we need to take note of. But I want you to know that it takes humility on both for the student and the teacher. So there's a mutual humility. There's a mutual respect that takes place. And for me, this is going all the way back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, where there's a mutual respect between um, a husband and a wife. Verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. To humble yourself before others is to humble yourself before God. To reject this attitude of humility toward others is to pick up a fight with God. Now those are strong words. But if you're not going to have a mutual respect for one another, um, you are, you're challenging God because God expects us to have that mutual respect. To embrace humility is to embrace help from God. Pride brings with it a battle of the will between God and the individual. So embrace the help of God. Embrace the Holy Spirit uh, to, uh, to, to help you walk, um, walk with the, the, the rest of the flock, if you will, and not simply be one of those voices that is always um, in opposition, opposition, opposition. Now, sometimes we need that. I understand that. But, but by and large, we want to learn how to, to function together, uh, to, to, uh, to mutually respect one another. So God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, this, this actually comes from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. And it also shows up in James chapter 4, verses 6 and 10. So God opposes the proud. Verse 7. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. This is interesting. The Greek here is casting cares. It's, it's, it's a throwing off. It's a, it's, a, it's a getting rid of. But this probably comes from Psalm 55 verse 22. Let me read that to you. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. The, the Hebrew word here in, the, in Psalm 55 has more to do with abandoning, to abandon an attitude. Uh, and, and I really like that. Now, when, when it was translated, um, they, and I didn't look at the Septuagint, so I don't quite know why, um, why the Greek word was used uh, of casting off. I mean, it's got the same idea. It's just this idea of ba abandoning is to, is to set something down and walk away from it intentionally. I just like that, that image. So Peter is saying, God cares so much for you that he will take what you give him so you can walk away. All that bad stuff, you just abandon it to God and you walk away from it. So don't keep it. Don't keep that baggage that you've got. But give it away. And you give it to God. And God takes it. And then you walk away from it is the image here. 
Because, this is what happens, you know it, I know it. If we don't abandon the baggage that we have, what do we do? Well, that's right, we hang on to it and then we start adding other stuff to it. And, and so you can, you can get multiple bags uh, and try to get multiple bags for TSA. You don't want to do that. I mean, this is, you, you want to get rid of this stuff as soon as you can. So what does this say? This says that God cares about everything, everything about you. And Peter's communicating that to these, to these pastors and to the flock in Asia Minor. God cares about you in, in, your, in the minutia of your life and in the, the, the suffering details of your life. And here's just a little, little tidbit. Get rid of the baggage. Abandon it to God. Verses 8 and 9. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood through, throughout the world. Now, what we've just stepped into in verses 8 and 9 is spiritual warfare. The devil uses suffering to get the upper hand in our lives and our souls. And notice the progression of Peter's argument in the last few verses. So he talks about pride in verses 5 and 6 and anxiety in verse 7. And it leads to a statement about the prowling lion who is Satan. Because Satan is the author of lies and pride and worry. So you get rid of it once again. You, you dump it. And we're not very astute to this. Peter, Peter I believe, is, is telling us something um, that he learned the hard way. And we know because we get to read the scriptures. But remember Matthew chapter 16. And we've read this before in, in this um, letter. Matthew chapter 16, verses 22 and 23. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So, so Peter is saying that, that he was afraid and prideful but he learned his lesson. Thus he is advising his flock to be mindful of spiritual warfare and make sure that they are self-controlled. Don't, 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 don't let the situations and the circumstances of life begin to drive you in such a way that you lose control. If you have control, what do you get to do? I'm not buying into this. This roaring lion, I'm going to resist the roaring lion as an act of my will. I'm going to take this baggage and I'm going to abandon it to God and walk away from it. So, you're, so there's this sense of being in control in the midst of the suffering and the pushback and everything else that comes in, in, in life. Resist him. I didn't speak loudly enough about this last night. We need to resist him. And this is going to show up in the, the end of, of this section in chapter 5. So resist him, firm in your faith, will show up again in just a little bit. Now, suffering is a part of the Christian life. And we've been saying that from day one that we started this book. No matter if you are in the Middle East Eastern Europe or in Las Cruces. The intensity of the suffering may be different, but nevertheless, suffering unites us as we turn our eyes upon Jesus. And, and it doesn't mean that we go out to, to get abused or anything like that. We're not saying that. But when it happens, what, what the, the, the universal ex experience is that it unites us. So, we have in 1915, uh, the, uh, the, the slaughter of the Armenian Orthodox at the hands of the Turks. We have the slaughter of the Syrian Orthodox in 2015. 
And by the way, Armenians got caught up in that because ISIS doesn't make a distinction between Armenian Orthodox and Syrian Orthodox. So, so everybody gets caught up in that. These kinds of suffering are horrific. I'm beyond anything that you and I can even imagine. We, haven't, we have never not experienced that. And, that. and yet, your suffering, though, however great or small it may be, unites us with the suffering of the rest of the, of, of, of the Christians, the, the little Christ in the world. So I've had, uh, over the years, I've had some veterans come to me and uh, reluctantly saying, oh, I just don't, feel like I uh, like Veterans Day is for me because I'm not a I'm not a combat vet you know and kind of embarrassed by that and that's not what Veterans Day is about for example if Veterans Day is about everyone who has served why because there is a sacrifice that is made by every single um, uh, a person who who serves in the military and it may be great and it may be small but it doesn't matter see Veterans Day is for everybody every vet whether combat or non-combat vets and I think that's what that's what Peter is saying about our the, the Christians and, and the level of suffering that we have um, it unites us all into one body we pray more heavily I hope for those uh, in the Middle East, especially now, thank goodness, uh, thank goodness, um, the Allied forces are pushing back now um, with ISIS. And last I heard, they're down to only 6,000 in their forces, which used to be 40 and 50,000 strong. So, here are the final few verses that. Uh, we need to look at, and that is verses 10 and 11, which, which conclude this section, and then we have a, a few verses in the very final salutation. Verse 10 and 11, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So a few, uh, few words and phrases that we need to look at, especially in verse 10. It says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace. Now, all grace is defined here, I think, um, by sustaining grace. But when I saw all grace, what it reminded me of was the theology of grace. Now let me just kind of rehearse for you what the theology of grace looks like. It's in four parts. Grace comes to us in four parts. The first part is prevenient grace. P-R-E-V-E-N-I-E-N-T. Prevenient grace. Now this is the grace that, that goes before, this is, the, this is the Holy Spirit going before and working on the hearts of men and women, boys and girls. If you're here today, it's because of prevenient grace at some point in your life. God prepared your heart to, to, for an aha moment to say, oh, there is a God. Oh, or as someone said last night, I didn't think Jesus was real, but now I'm absolutely convinced. I mean, you know, there's there's those there are moments in those lives when when we kind of, when we recognize what's going on. That's prevenient grace. It doesn't happen unless the Holy Spirit's already working in your heart and making making you aware. Then we move to what I call transforming grace, and others call it saving grace. So this transformative grace is when after the aha moment in your life, and you can have multiple aha moments, and it's all provenient grace. It's all the, the, the going ahead, <laughs> the Holy Spirit going ahead. Uh, but then there's the saving grace, and this is the grace where you, you settle into the fact that you are a creature, that you are a son or a daughter 
of the of the Creator that you are at the mercy of Jesus on the cross. This is that moment where you, in your aha, say, I am totally dependent on, on God. Then we move to the third kind of grace, and that is called habitual grace. Habitual grace. Now, habitual grace is where you start settling into the transformative grace and you start living your life and your decisions start reflecting that that aha saving grace in your life the way you think is starting to be changed and transformed and it becomes a part of your life to function as a um, as, as a as a, a Christian a believer and then we come to the fourth and final form of grace and it's called sustaining grace and this is what I believe Peter is referring to in his in his uh, letter in verse 10 but sustaining grace is realizing that you are in the palm of God's hand what a wonderful aha moment <laughs> that you are sustained by God you are sustained by the Holy Spirit so, four kinds of grace, prevenient grace, transforming grace, habitual grace, and sustaining grace. Now, Peter refers to those who have been called, who has called you to eternal glory in Christ. So, he's called you, chosen. You remember chapter 1, verse 1? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. So right in the very first uh, sentence, he lays out for us that he's talking about those who have been chosen. Elect exiles. So you have been called. You have been chosen. And then he goes into this wonderful statement about eternal glory in Christ. It's glory is like when he says all grace. Well, I think you could probably put in there all glory. Everything moves towards worship and honor that's given to, to God in Christ. Everything we do then enters into an attitude and a posture of, of, uh, of worship and honor. Always given to God in Christ. Doesn't mean that they're, they're not one. It just simply gives us a picture of how we worship. And the worship is always directed to God in Christ. So Christ is essential in every step of the way. Um, um, but it's directed toward God. Then in Christ. This is really one of the aha moments for me or one of the takeaways that I have from this book is to recognize the connection that that is that Peter has with Paul. Paul, especially in the book of Ephesians, talks about what it means to be in Christ. And it's been just gratifying to me to realize how Peter utilizes that same phrase of being in Christ. So all so his eternal glory in Christ with himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. All right. Let's finish this up. Verse 12, by Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. There's that word grace again. And 
So by Sylvanus or by Silas. Does anyone's book uh, translation have Silas? You do, yeah. Sylvanus or Silas. It's the same person. Yeah, we think it's the same person, which is, which is really significant. So ironically, it was Paul's difficulty with Barnabas, Barnabas' young cousin Mark, on the first missionary journey that has Mark replaced and Silas brought in, okay? Very interesting. Now, maybe Peter's, um, uh, maybe Silas is in fact Peter's scribe or Peter's secretary here because he says, by Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly. What it means is I've dictated to Silvanus or Silas and Silas has written all of this down as a faithful, uh, he's faithful to what he has done, the words that Peter has given him. So he's got a secretary. Um, we, um, we're pretty, I mean, I, I'm very comfortable by saying, you know, I think that, uh, um, that Silas is the, the same guy. Uh, and we, we can read about that in Acts chapter 15, verses 22, 27, 32, all that whole, actually the whole section of 15 through chapter 18 of the book of Acts has in it Silas. And that, that's, that's worth uh, a good read. Now, here's some of the irony that takes place. At the end of Peter's years, both Mark and Silas were working with Peter. Now, this is Colossians ch chapter 4, verse 10. Philippians... No, actually, I think that's Philemon. Yeah, Philemon 24. And 2 Timothy 4.11. Colossians 4.10. So the irony is that, that here we have Mark and Silas now working together with Peter. And I have written briefly to you, this is, this is Peter's um, chapter 12. I have written briefly to you exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Now look what he says there. Stand firm in it. Stand firm. So Peter is encouraging and comforting in the midst of the struggles of Christians in Western Asia Minor. And you have not been abandoned, Peter is saying. You are in God's sight and you, have, you should have confidence. So Peter is affirming all of these um, these uh, uh, brothers and sisters in the faith in Asia Minor. Stand firm. And what does it mean to stand firm? It means don't give up. Now, look at verse 13. This is fascinating. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark my son. She who is a, at Babylon. What does that mean? Okay, somebody who lives there. Is it Babylon? That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a uh, it's all it's almost like it's a code, isn't it? He he doesn't state that it's uh, Rome. He says she who has had Babylon. So she refers to the church. So the church at Babylon, who is likewise chosen. There's that word chosen again. That's uh, um, uh, called in, in, in verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 1, um, sends you greetings and so does Mark my son. So it was, it was a metaphorical reference to more importantly um, this, this uh, church in Rome. Now it may have been protection from persecution or, and I would say uh, this is, has a good, this is good possibility, it may be a reference to Babylon and to the Tower of Babel. Either way, it may be a reference, may be a reference to a place, um, to a place that that stands against God. So Babylon stands against God. 
Babel stands against God. So Rome stands against God, maybe what Peter is referring to. And it also could be foreshadowing of what's, what's going to come to the church of Rome in a few years. Remember, Peter died, we believe, tradition tells us, at the hand of Nero. Nero died in 64 uh, AD, so Peter may have died 63, 64. Babylon also represents um, Rome as a place of strangers in a strange land. And that resonates with me. Simply because in chapter 1, verse 1, he refers to the exiles. And the, the, that whole theme that is developed throughout the first Peter of being strangers in a strange land. Or strangers in your own land. So Babylon also represents pride and self-reliance, that is, living life away from God. And then he refers to, and so does Mark, my son. Now Mark and Peter's, Mark as Peter's son means that Peter is mentoring him. Do you remember, we talked early, at the, I think the very first session of this uh, book, about about the Gospel of Mark, and Mark, I believe, I'm, I'm a nobody, but I believe the scholars who have put forth for many years now that, uh, that Mark compiled Peter's sermons and created the story of Jesus in what we call today the Gospel of Mark. Now, this connection that we see at the end of 1 Peter um, makes that seem really possible. That here Mark is working with, um, with, with, uh, with Peter. Um, he's being mentored by Peter. And so what he does then is, uh, was upon Peter's death, is that he takes all those sermons and he compiles it. Now, we're at the very end. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Now the kiss of love can also be called the holy kiss. And it was a way of greeting one another in the early church. But it also represents peace. And notice the very last sentence. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. It's not peace to all of you who are in the world. The wor you're not drawing your peace from the world. He's saying you're going to draw your peace by being in Christ. And there it is, right at the very end of this book, that wonderful phrase, that, par that uh, um, prepositional phrase, in Christ again. Now to be in Christ, just let me remind you, is not that we come along Christ, but that Christ is in us and we are in Christ. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a fellowship that is bound together. So we are in Christ. Maybe it's, maybe it's Peter's way of uh, capturing John's poetic way of saying it in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives to, not as the world gives do I give to you let not your hearts be troubled neither let them be afraid that's what Jesus said captured in uh, in um, John chapter 14 so Peter ends his letter in Christ an invitation to be a part of Christ and to live your life in him okay that brings us to a close uh, let me just simply ask you, what, what are the takeaways for you from this book? What are you taking away from, uh, from this uh, study of Peter? Anybody?
with Christ and the Holy Spirit. And that's the only way that, that these how-tos then really work. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Greta said that uh, we are inundated in our culture with how-to books. And yet Peter is giving us a how-to in the, the, this last section. <clears throat> but the difference is how-to happens in the Trinity, in, in the Godhead. Yeah, and, so, and, and I, uh, yeah, I appreciate what you're saying there. It's not, it's not just us in how we you know, make things happen, but we make things happen in the Trinity. Things happen in the Trinity. Yeah. Anybody have a, a, a takeaway for to share? Was this gospel of Mark hastily put together because they needed one? Well, that's that's a great question, Don, and I don't have the answer to that. Don's asking, uh, was uh, was the gospel of Mark hastily put together because they needed a gospel at that time? Uh, uh, I don't know that. It was that, the first one, right? It was, in my opinion, yes, it is the first one. And the reason why uh, scholars think that is that uh, what tends to happen, if you, if you base your writing on somebody else's writing, your writing tends to expand and get bigger. And every time we base a writing on an, uh, an original, it doesn't get smaller, it actually gets bigger. And so then you have, um, you have Matthew and Luke who seem to be basing their writings on, on Mark, it's amplified in both of their, because they bring in the, the nativity, they bring in more stuff about post-resurrection um, and, and amplify the teachings in, of Jesus. Now, we also believe that there is probably another source out there that both um, Matthew and Luke were using, and we call that the Q, the Q source. We don't know who it is, what it is, but it, they seem to have access to more things than than, uh, than Mark did. Um, so that, I think that's a great question. I wish I had the knowledge to answer that, uh, but I think that's, that's a, a fair question to ask. Maybe, maybe it's so small, maybe it's only a few, you know, 16 chapters because, uh, because they were hurriedly trying to get the gospel out, the, the good news out. You know that mostly he's, Peter is talking about suffering as a Christian. Right. But we can apply this to all life situations. That's what I was thinking about last night. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sylvia um, is saying that um, we can apply the what we're learning in First Peter to all of life. Yeah. And I. Yeah. Peter is talking specifically about Christians. Um, but if you've got if you've got Christ in your heart, any suffering then yeah. <laughs> you can. You can you can face that suffering with how to, as as Greta was saying, you know, re rejoice. You know you're being you're you're in the midst of testing. You're being tempered. Um, don't be afraid of it. Go through it. Um, stand your ground, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, that's good. I wonder too. The longer our suffering isn't so that when we meet someone else who's suffering, it maybe has or does not. Christ, yep. That we've been through it. That's right. So we can kind of comfort the one that's going through. That's right. Um, yeah, Sylvia's saying. I wonder if uh, suffering also has the aspect of tempering us, but it helps us then comfort and walk with somebody who's going through suffering. And I think you're right. I think that's why he wants the the elders in this to have an understanding of suffering so that they can walk with people through this. Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's, that's a, a fair takeaway from this book, yeah. Anybody else? In, in the suffering and, and this kind of thing, we can't seek it, though. No. Just to be able to check it off. That's correct. Yeah. That's well said, if, yeah. So if we have if we have things in the proper order, it can't happen. We know that the suffering will come. Yeah. But we can't bring it on ourselves just to say we've done it. Yeah. Then they're done that yep. kind of thing. Uh, because that shifts yeah. the whole uh, the whole emphasis to us. Exactly. Yeah. That's not where it is. 
That's right. That's right. Let me let me try to communicate that because that's that's a really fine statement. Um, uh, Greta is simply saying that uh, we can't go out looking for suffering so that we can then check it off the check you know our list of things that we've done. That if if we're doing that, what we're doing is putting the focus on us um, instead of the focus on Christ. And as our in our relationship with Christ, uh, suffering comes from outside. Then we face it. We face it the way Sylvia is um, suggesting, um, and it takes the focus off of us. But the benefits, the, the, the take-homes out of this is now we get to shepherd somebody who's been through this. We're not looking for it, but now we become a shepherd. And that's that mutual respect, that I think, that takes place um, in, the, uh, in, in the community, is that we can, we can help one another. That builds community, too. But, Greta, your point is well taken. We're not looking for it. Is there anyone know that really seeks suffering? Um, is there anybody who really seeks suffering? I would say yes. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's probably more going on in them than... than uh, <laughs> there's, there's probably a, a relatively... There's probably some form of, uh, of mental illness in the midst of that. You don't seek suffering. Yeah, for sure. Or just seeking someone who is suffering, uh, that, that helper, uh, you know, of, of finding a cause. Oh, okay. See, for all the wrong reasons, perhaps. But looking for a cause. And okay. Then, then, because that's, that, if we look for a cause, it puts ourselves in the center of the action which is not where it should be, that the shepherd only goes out seeking who, who the shepherd knows is lost. Right. The sheep that got in trouble. Right. And stuff. And if there's if none of them are in trouble, the shepherd doesn't make trouble. Yeah, okay. I, I see what you're saying, yeah. Save the sheep or two. Yeah, so, so we don't go out um, uh, uh, just seeking cause, a cause to get involved in to, to create suffering, but your 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 point is that the shepherds go out to look for those who are who are lost to bring them back into the fold, um, and it, and if they get bored, they can't just go out looking for <laughs> suffering. I guess. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, I'm going to bring this to a close. I, what I will say to you is that I'm Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. I would like to start. Um, a four-part session on discernment. What does it mean to discern? Uh, and I'm not just talking about uh, a process of making decisions. I'm talking about uh, discerning the will of God, discerning what God might be doing in somebody's life. So, and I'm going to try to get uh, um, Deacon Ann to help me with that because uh, she's a she's a, a good one. And maybe maybe some other testimonies. I've got uh, I heard testimonies last night about learning discernment, which was fabulous. Um, so let's, if you don't mind, I I would like to move into a little different kind of teaching on Thursdays, and that'll be, what does it mean to discern? Okay, thank you for coming. Amen. When you want to start that. Well, that concludes First Peter. I hope you've had some significant takeaways, like I have. This has been a book that's been on my heart for a long time, and I'm delighted that I've had the chance to, to study it, and I'm delighted that you've been with us. We've gone through five chapters. We've talked about suffering. We've talked about testing. Uh, we've talked about what it means to submit, and we've talked about what it means to have an attitude of humility. I hope that this book has touched you as deeply as it's touched me. Well, get ready, because we're going to start another series, and that series is called Discernment. We want to look at what it means to discern the will of God in our lives. It's a little bit different for us to be looking at this particular topic, but I think it's timely, especially coming after 1 Peter. So get ready for more from uh, St. Andrews. Bye. <laughs>